Saif, um, before we get to Grand Wizard yeah. Theodore and his story, what are your, let's, while we're talking about Zulu Nation, mm. your early recollections of when you first heard about and had any interaction with Zulu Nation? Um, not much. I mean, Africa Bambada, obviously, and uh, the records he put out. Um, Q-tip going, Zulu Nation! Yeah, like, <laughs> like Tribe, really, like. Jungle Brothers and Tribe? Tribe, not, uh, Jungle Brothers, I started to like after Tribe. So Me too, like, actually. So Tribe, hearing remnants of it. Because most rappers I know in those days were saying a lot of 5% stuff. And Q-Tip was saying like Zulu Nation stuff. So I was like, oh, this must be something different. And how, you know, obviously Jazzy J, who's founding, would, is he, would you say he's a founding father of Zulu Nation? Um, I mean, Africa Bambada we know is the founding father. Right, right. But um, and do you? What's your? Do you have an official relationship with Zulu Nation? Have you always just been in? What's your relationship? Oh Theodore? yeah, definitely. Um, I felt I was a Zulu Nation from the day I was born, because all the teachings and all the practices that the Zulu Nation teach everyone, no matter what color you are, I practice that every day. You know, I I drink a lot of water. Um, I eat a lot of steamed vegetables. Um, Sife, this is like you. You are Sife. You are now Zulu Nation. You yes, know. Um, I, tr I I try to learn about. All the different different uh, ethnic people. Like when I go to Japan, I try to learn about their culture. If I go to Brazil, if I go to different parts of the world, I want to learn about, you know, their culture. I want them to learn about my culture and stuff like that. And, you know, what makes Zulu Nation so unique is that, you know, you know they, they teach you about your ancestors. No matter what color you are, you know, it's, it's good to learn about your ancestors. It's good to eat the right foods. It's good to respect your elders. It's good to go to school and, and learn, you um, you know, learn stuff so that you can be, you know, you can have a contribution to the world, you know? Um, let's talk a little bit about your story, Theodore. You were born in South Carolina, is that correct? Well, I was actually born in Harlem Hospital, same okay. hospital that um, DMC was born in. Wow. Shout out to DMC from um, from Run DMC. Um, and um, and I was born, um, I was raised in the, in the Bronx. Why, why did it say on, online that you moved to South Carolina? Was that, is that an existent thing or that's... Well, um... My family is from, you know, South Carolina, Lower South Carolina, you know, Greensboro and stuff like that, you know, and, you know, you know, one of the one of the things about about, you know, us um, pioneers still being here, we have to make sure that we teach everybody and make sure that everybody learn the right information. about Absolutely. Us. And that's another reason why we have the, um, the hip hop museum coming out and the hip hop museum is going to be coming out and, and we're going to make sure that everybody, my kids, your kids our grandkids and so on and so forth could know about all the pioneers and, and, and the contributions that they made to this art form, this culture we call hip hop, past, present, and future. So how did the music thing start for you, Theodore? Well, the music started for me through my brother Mean Gene and Grandmaster Flash. That's how I got introduced to the whole you know, hip hop culture, the whole hip hop art form and stuff like that. When I see my brother Mean Gene and Grandmaster Flash with two turntables and a mixer, Right then and there, that's what I knew what I wanted to do. Uh, to the to the degree that you are credited with inventing the scratch, how how talk about that? Well, I created um um two styles of DJing, which is the needle drop and the scratch. Were you there with me the day I was watching the needle drops? No. On YouTube? No. <laughs> it is the most bonkers thing I've bonkers. ever watched in my Yo, Theodore, I was practicing last night. And wow. I've I've gotten within like a couple of bars of getting it right. Wow. So okay, st start with that. So you just that was just something you started messing with. And for people who don't know what that means, the needle drop is literally lifting up the needle and dropping it on the record as if almost you have two copies of the record because yes. you're bringing it back to the same exact spot. Yes. Favorite, yes. my favorite yes. thing to do. It, yes. To do? Yes. Well, you yeah. just have one record. Dropping. One or two is my, it's my favorite thing to and do. And you're just catching it on the right spot? Yeah, I, I, I how put do you... a couple of videos up on Instagram of doing it. Yeah, how, yeah, how, how are you doing it? Sure the way he does it. Um, like you, like, you see where to put it? You know, like let's say there's a break and, and you just pick the needle up. Let's say you're doing it with two turntables. Yeah. You leave the fader in the middle. Right. And you just pick the needle up, drop it on a break, go to the next one, on drop beat. it on a break, on beat. No headphones. No headphones. No fader use. Right. Leave both. Leave the fader in the middle. Both turntables on. <laughs> pick the needle up. Drop it. Pick the needle up. Drop crazy. it. I show you. I show you a video. Oh my god. Yeah. So so you just started messing around. Well, what I did was, um, my mother had like one of those big long coffins. You know, it's a big long coffin, and in the front 
is a television, and when you lift the coffin up, the turntable is inside. Component wow. set. Yeah, yeah. So um, I used to play her 45s, and when it got to the break part of the 45, which is the darkest part of the record, yeah. I used to lift the needle up back to the beginning of the break, and not knowing that... Um, the many times as I did it and the longer times I do it, I was developing the needle drop style. So when I got on the big turntables, the, the needle drop style was like, it was practically, it was it was already there, you know? So, it, so and do how long did it take you to get to the point, or do you not even remember because you just did it naturally, where you could do it seamlessly and always hit the same spot? Because for anyone out here who's listening who is not even a DJ but simply has a turntable or has messed around, mm -hmm. Getting any spot with a record, with a needle, is very difficult. It takes really having a knowledge of records and mm -hmm. how to be comfortable holding a needle to even do that. Right, right. So did did you, it just happened over time that you started getting really good at dropping yeah, the right time, spot? Yeah, over time, because I have no idea what I was doing. I was just, the only thing I was worried about and concentrating on was getting the needle back to the beginning of the break because it sounded so good to me, not knowing that as time went by and the more I, I, I matured as a person, you know, it just it just it just came so natural and then it got to the point where i started to count because it all you have to count too it's like the bars one two three four one bar one two three four two bars so i will count the record and then i will watch the record go around in the 360 knowing that if you have a record that says um sly and the family stones and you know that the break comes in at the word sly when you pick the needle up and to sly it comes right back to the to the break part. So when you watch the record go around, when you start counting, and when you lift the needle up just at the right time, it all it all coincides with each other, and that's how I created. The how do you think you drop. would do with this? I'm just checking it out. <laughs> <laughs> it's, no, I think if you would be taught the the fundamentals, like I just explained, you know, yeah, counting I'm the record. To figure it out. If it takes sure a lot of practice or feeling. Yeah, that's how I taught myself on, <laughs> on my mother's uh, component set. Same way, actually, and um. With Dance the Drummer's Beat when that first came out. Yeah. That's, that's oh the one to do God. it. In uh, 1978, wow. the uh, Electric Cat version with the whistle. Oh, yes. Oh, my God. And I would just pick the needle up and keep dropping it on that on that break because that was just the fun part of the record. And I would just do that. Drop it, drop it. It wasn't, the record wasn't on beat, but I would always catch it at the beginning of the break. And Damn. by the time I got to, to real turntables, that was just natural yeah, to do. Yeah. So what about the scratching thing, Theodore? This is a, I don't know if you know, this is sort of a big deal. Sort of a big deal. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm just very happy to be a part of something that's bigger than I am and to be able to say that I, I contribute to my contribution to this to this art form, to this culture, you know, basically help, you know, change the world as we as we all know it. Now, my last year of junior high school, my principal played music through the loudspeakers in the lunchroom. And people got tired of listening to that crazy, you know, Van McCoy music he was playing, Donna Summer and stuff he was mm -hmm. playing. Mm -hmm. So a friend of mine's, you know, he convinced my principal to let me make a cassette tape. So what I did was I went home to make a cassette tape. And back in the early days, in order for us to make a cassette tape, we had to take a big boom box and put it in front of the speaker and press record. I mean, sometimes when we do block parties, you see guys with a boom box standing in front of the bass speaker for like an hour you know, you got two, you got 45 minutes on each side, so like 90 yeah. minutes standing in front of the bass speaker. And then once the cassette is finished, they go in the corner and press play, and all they hear is because <laughs> the speaker is the. the, the it's, they recorded the wrong speaker. Yeah, they, yeah, they, they, yeah, there, yeah. Were, there were no input output jacks on, on boom boxes back then. Yeah, so they basically got the boom box in the bass instead of having it right, in but the you tweeters. Don't want, yeah, for recording, you don't want the, That's not going to work out. <laughs> yeah. I so, just love what, what amazes me about this is that the culture as we know it would exist if there weren't people who were willing to take that kind of care like no I know the party's going on mm -hmm. but I'm gonna record because that's really so much of the things that you guys all learned to do and then we all ended up learning through different iterations later mm -hmm. is because people were willing to do that if it had been me and Saif who started the culture it would we would have just <laughs> went to sleep we would have just left this is too difficult this is a pain I gotta hold the stereo the whole time um, so, okay, but you did skirt the question, Theodore. Yes, sir. As you sit next to DJ Scratch, mm -hmm. are, do you credit yourself as inventing the Scratch? Uh, yes, yes. I'm so, you finish uh, the story, yeah, junior no, high school. No, oh, so no, take us back no, to junior no. high school. Sorry, I got, I got, I got no, scared. Yes. And then, um, um, 
uh, I started making um the uh, the cassette. Okay. And the music that I was practicing practicing on is in my mother's house. And I got the kind of mother where she doesn't argue, she doesn't raise her voice, she just starts swinging like Mike Tyson. <laughs> That's where my mom's is. She come home, this is not done, she starts swinging. Come where, home, where is she from? What's your ethnic uh, background? Uh, she's from the um, Car- Carolinas. Okay, exactly. and is she, an American? I mean, where are they from before that? Uh, you from uh, the islands? An or? African living in America. Okay, African. <laughs> okay. Right. As we call it. And, um, you know, it's like, when she busts in the room, I was playing... I was playing music. I was playing a record, and and and, and back then, um, our mixers crossfaders didn't go from left to right. Our crossfaders went up and down. So when moms came and bust in the room, um, um, both my crossfaders went up because she kind of startled me because I had one record going off and one record I needed to to blend in. So when she startled me, both both crossfaders went up in the air, which means that I could hear both records at the same time. So what I did was I did a baby scratch. Pulled the music down a little bit. She left the room, played the next record, um, finished my cassette tape, and when I rewinded back to the part where my mother came in the room, I can hear myself baby scratching. I was like, wow, I can incorporate that into all the other things that I do as a DJ. So I practiced it another couple of days, another couple of hours, different records, and and that's when it became the scratch. I was 12 years old in 1975, which makes me... What, 22 years old? 22 yeah. years old, man. You were 22. Yeah. So, I mean... But other people must have been doing it in their headphones, right? Or getting the record ready. Like, but no one put the fader up to hear it. Right, yeah. Like, had you ever done it before while you were doing... Like, while you were cueing a record but didn't realize it was something that could sound good? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. You're like, absolutely so, like, right. Like, even DJs before right. hip-hop... When you worked at a radio station and the way you played music was, was pulling vital. the record Somebody back. Somebody had to pull it back with their hand, but right. it probably sounded wrong. It was right. Like, oh, that. Uh, you happened to get one. You had right. the fader up. You're absolutely right. And then you heard it and was like, that shit sounds kind of right. Yeah. So what? <laughs> you know, so what? You know, back what we, then it was a lot of it, it was a lot of rules as far as DJing. Like mm-hmm. you weren't supposed to put your fingers on the record. That right. was a rule. On the side, right? And you're supposed to grab the side. Right. Like if you ever see any footage from the early 80s or they're 70, all on the top of them they're like this yeah. yeah and then then these guys they just broke the rules and put their fingers on the record right <laughs> you know and that just changed the game so funny by the way that people thought that like touching the record was so bad it was it was bad it but why it's it not still really that, is. it's not it's that bad, bad. well it, one is. of the reasons why if you clean bad. your records you can touch the record it's not gonna destroy the groove there are things we do that are worse the needles weren't as good back then right the right, right. were floppy back then any dust or yes or, oil on your hands yeah like all that oil you know? on the dust like we know how to master it now plus the vinyl's way better now or like not now but you the know the needles are made better now yeah. for 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 scratching it. Right, 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 right. Especially so, back in the days with us it's like, you know, you know, you know your parents, you know, were having dinner and you got potato salad on your hands and <laughs> barbecue sauce and you want to put it on the record. That was no, like a no-no. The, yeah, of course. It was a no-no. Back then know? the needles if you pulled the record back probably the needle would probably fucking snap backwards like the needle the needles yeah. were more the needles were more actually Sharper, like they and more damaging to the record, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so okay, what <laughs> what turntable did this happen on? Some I had a technique. I was I think it was a technique uh, twenty three hundred. I think it was. Was it belt? It was. Uh, yes, it was belt drive. It's a yes. belt drive. But who who's you were twelve? Whose turntable was it? Your brother's or? Uh, yeah, it was my brother's turntable. Yeah. Did he have a set? Yeah, he had, he had a set. Had yeah, because you said yeah. you had the mixer. So at that point. What was considered a DJ mixer was just a smaller, not a huge mixing board, a smaller board with only vertical levers. Yes. And you would just pot up and down and that's it. Yes. Because this is all pre uh, the single pole double throw Absolutely. switch. Yes. So at this point, so you start practicing the scratch. When did you start, when did you first break it out and someone else saw it and was like, what are you doing? <laughs> well, we used to do. Back in the early days, and um, a lot of DJs, when the summertime came, that was time for the DJ to to do as many block parties as he possibly can, so that when it gets winter time and we go to school and start handing out flyers, everybody will remember us from the block parties. Okay, these guys used to do block parties. They play good music. They got a nice little sound system. Okay, let's go and 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 let's go today. You know, let's go to their party on the inside, and. Um, when I first did the scratch in the park, it, it basically electrified the crowd because it's like hearing your favorite record and hearing me 
interject certain parts of the record and and the b-boys went crazy everybody in the party started you know coming up to the front of the um you know coming up to the front of the uh turntables wondering why i'm i'm cutting up rick james and and evelyn champagne king and 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 dennis coffee breaks and stuff like that and trying to figure out how does this little kid like you know keep interjecting certain parts and scratching certain parts of the record it just it just basically electrified everybody you know and that's the long the more time went by was the more time that my skills kept getting better and better and better as as a DJ. But you know? but other people were playing parts of records, right? Like breaks. But they were like mixing them in. Well Like um, why was the scr- like you actually like the noise, like the Yes. So how were that people doing foreign to people at the time? Yeah, that's definitely. Def- so what was so people were just simply before that dragging the record back and then starting it. Exactly. Without letting you hear the drag back. Exactly. You would simply yes. hear, they'd bring it down, mm-hmm. they'd bring down, if they're on the left turntable, they would bring down the right pot, they would cue back to the spot, mm-hmm. then they would release it, lift up the right pot, and let exactly. that record go and pull down the left one. So right. if you were good, like who was, like Flash was obviously good back then. Yes, would, me, it me. would be no, It would be on beat. Yes. Like he would keep bringing the beat, the break on beat. Exactly, yes. And then you added the. Right. Yeah. Uh, 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 how yeah, back then, uh, that first scratch had, how bad was your first scratch? The early scratches, because even early scratches on records in rap ooh. are terrible when you go back and listen to them, <laughs> yes, oh, to yes, where uh, it came. Yes. I mean, God bless, I'm not going to name names of some whole of our famed pioneers. Nother, that's a whole nother. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole nother thing. <laughs> a whole nother show. Scratch, honestly, pre-you, like, it's it really, it, your era is when it started to change, that the scratches became, I mean, so what you're saying, which is arguably groundbreaking. I mean, so what you're saying, arguably, Saif, would you say arguably the best, one of the best scratch yeah, moments of all saying, time? Yeah, on a I chorus. Mean, I mean, definitely sets it off. Like that before yeah. that, you know, you listen to some, you're like, you, what were we even doing? I mean, I have to admit, like, the, my baby scratches were a little, a little sloppy and stuff like that. But as time went on, I can, my, I felt my scratches get a little bit more tighter, you know, because my mentality was like. If I want to get noticed, I have to do something different. Yeah. I have to be different from all the other DJs, you know. And me and Flash was basically the only DJ. Like Flash came up with with extending breaks and stuff like that. Um, um, if a break is ten seconds long, Flash would make it three, four minutes long. Um, he created a theory called the backspin, where you know he would get the break, and then the then the break would go, and the record would revolve like two, three times in the 360, and he would like pull the record back two, three times, and get it back to um the break and stuff like that. So you know, a uh, flash and I was basically our skills were so advanced to where DJs were chasing us. And the what mo- are the DJs doing though? Just playing songs? Yeah, just playing songs. It it, it, it it's like. It's like it's like listening to a song and 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 everybody's dancing and then when they switch the record you have to stop dancing and then catch the beat again. So oh, they weren't doing it on beat. Really. No, they was not they doing it on songs. beat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was like and nobody. I mean, were people mad? That's just the way it was back then. It was a little frustrating, you know. You on the floor, you, you dance with your girl. girl you dance with the you know you you dance with the pretty girl yeah. and all of a sudden the record change and it skips a beat and you have to stop. And then you have to catch on. But it was kind like of that. normal, though. Yeah, it was normal. Yes, it was normal. And then when Flash and you and all the dudes started catching it on beat, it was like, oh, this shit is. We haven't stopped yet. Right. This you don't know when the record. You don't know when the yeah, record switched. That break you know? part, like that's when the BPMs came into play and right. stuff right. like that. And you know, because you could be playing, you could be playing Van McCoy, which is probably like. 120 beats per minute, mm-hmm. and, then and then you'll switch to, into a, like a James uh, Brown, a James Brown like which is like 90s. <laughs> people like, people, but it's a good song though. Yeah, people like look at you like, wow, are you are you you what are you drinking, Fuki Plum, or are you you know uh, 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 a Boonsbury Farm, or <laughs> you know? It's, uh, Saif, what's really, Fuki Plum? I'm not sure. <laughs> like what I like what it's I like remember. A wine. It's like a wine. wine. Okay. <laughs> like what I remember as a as a child. What I remember as a child, like I seen two types of DJs. Like w- when I was a child, like, like I'm from Brooklyn, so Grandmaster Flowers, he was like one of the best DJs. Um, like he was a disco DJ, so he would blend songs neatly because to keep the party going. But then I also noticed when when the style of DJs change as far as the breaks are concerned, we're finding different breaks. Um, a DJ would just bring the record over. There was no real cueing. So it would be offbeat. So 
if you can't, so if you got one record playing, the next record's coming on. There's there was real really no cueing at the time, so it would just be off beat, and that it was okay. How did okay. the disco DJs do it then? The though? disco DJs they was they would just count. You know what I mean? Like most dis if if you remember, most disco records were the same tempo. Yeah, they're all around the same, so that so certainly helps. It wasn't helps. hard to keep keep the beat going. So, so yeah, I guess I mean. We look at DJ. We look at like hip hop and DJing as the beginning, but there was people spinning records on turntables records way from before. the beginning of time. Yeah. <laughs> like some like of those blends were probably nasty. It's not a hip hop club. No. But somebody was in there mixing records with two turntables always, right? Yes. Right. Yes. 